So today we have a really fantastic panel spanning the whole state of California and spanning the whole spectrum of education from journalism to computer science and neuroscience. So a uh, very diverse panel. And the topic of the panel is beyond edutainment. So really talking about how these immersive technologies can be used for teaching and learning as pedagogical tools and not just cool technology. Even though I and everybody else likes tool, cool technology, we want it to be actually uh, effective. So before we get the conversation started, I'd like to give each panelist an opportunity to introduce yourself, um, the institution you're from, and kind of a one sentence description of how you're using immersive technology in your teaching and learning. So we'll start with Linnea. Okay. Hi everybody, I'm Linnea. Um, I'm an alumni of SDSU. Um, <laughs> and I teach in the humanities department. Um, I'm teaching uh, a class, my class that I'm using AR and VR right now is called The Future, appropriately. Um, how I use AR and VR in the classroom, um, really easy in the LRS 1120 because it's built right in, um, so we have lab time there. But uh, generally speaking, we analyze and critique um, media narratives of the future in literature, in transmedia, um, and then we also read theories such as Turing, and then we physically explore those theoretical critiques. Excellent. And we're sharing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Peter Young, and uh, professor of uh, New Media Technologies, uh, the School of, Techno School of uh, Journalism and Mass Communications at San Jose State University. And uh, my project really is focused on uh, 360 VR storytelling standards. And the operative word is standards. Uh, one of the things we know from journalism and mass comm is that they have, for uh, eons, um, been driven by standards. And all of a sudden, we have all sorts of new technology. Uh, and that's throwing a very large wrench in the wheel of life. <laughs> and so we're starting to see some ethical problems, uh, some conundrums of people in the field. And so we're going to be examining all of these issues for the remainder of this semester in my course, uh, as well as into the spring. And one additional shout out. Um, today, we just turned on our website. It, you like the, you like the, the website uh, address? It's very nice. 360news.today. Cool. Can't get any better than that. Anyway, it just, it just went up today, so I invite everybody to take a look. Uh, and it's a work in progress, so please uh, add all my brothers and sisters from all 22 other campuses. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. Right. Oh, yeah. so we get to share. Hi, I'm Bernie Dodge. Uh, I'm professor of learning design and technology uh, here on this campus, which is also housed in the, the School of Journalism and Media Studies. Um, I'm here because I teach in the lab that some of you saw today, the Vital Lab, uh, and I teach, I don't teach with VR and AR, I teach about v VR and AR, et cetera. Uh, so uh, what, what, I, what I have to offer is, is, uh, is sort of how, how do you do that, especially when you don't yet have the kind of lab that we have here and the kind of equipment and, and where the technology is not quite ready for you. I, I have some tales to, to share about how to do that. Hi guys, uh, I'm Sim Baweja. I'm a physical therapist uh, by trade and I'm a professor for physical therapy and neuroscience over here. I am here in the capacity of a mad scientist. <laughs> I have a neuroscience lab where we test uh, people with Parkinson's disease and movement disorders in virtual environments. So it's a safer place than uh, testing them in the real world. And uh, I'm also here in the capacity of uh, the ITS faculty fellow for immersive learning. So any questions you have regarding uh, how to set up, because I went through that four or five years ago, setting it up, and uh, we went from uh, fishing lines to dog leashes, and we can talk about that. <laughs> uh, so I'm here for that for you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Red. I'm the director of eCampus at San Jose State University. And our department, we work with faculty to take their ideas and help them come true. Um, so we help faculty to implement different VR um, activities, and we also work with students to help them design those activities, and that's been what we've been working on this semester to help students build their skills in very, uh, various software that he was mentioning in the earlier talk. Hi, uh, I'm Barry Evans. Uh, I'm actually a computer science student here at San Diego State. Uh, I also run the uh, game development community here. So. Uh, we're kind of, we, we saw this huge um, demand for uh, some type of game development community, so we brought people together, uh, and now we're educating the community, and hopefully we'll be able to, uh, by the spring, 
um, or the following fall we'll have a community of developers that can start developing these uh, educational experiences for faculty. Hello, I'm Michaela Popesco. I'm a professor of communication studies at California State San Bernardino. I'm also the faculty associate with Academic Technologies and Innovation, which is a division of Information Technology Services um, at Cal State San Bernardino. So as a professor, I teach about VR and other immersive technologies, but as a member of the ATI division, I uh, work with ATI staff and other professors to build an archeological game in VR, and at the same time, um, as we are learning various skills, we are also trying to design courses that are teaching those skills to students. Excellent. So we'll start out with some uh, specific questions for individual panelists, and then we'll go to group questions, and finally, questions from the audience. So I'd like to start with Bernie. Um, the question of equity and accessibility to this technology has come up a lot. And I've heard you talk about um, VR on a shoestring. Could you talk about that a bit? Sure. I, I, and some might dispute whether it's VR or not, but let's say it's immersion on a shoestring. Uh, I've been teaching this class about VR for two years now. And back then, we didn't have the lab that Sean has, has uh, put together. Uh, and, and is very helpful in. We didn't have nearly the kind of uh, technology as readily available, but we, we knew this was something that was coming. We needed to, to uh, learn about it and play with it as quickly and as deeply as we could. So I think, and, and you all may be in the same position. You don't yet have a lab like the one we have here, and you don't, you don't have a room full of uh, people like Barry uh, to, to write software for you in Unity to make stuff happen. So where do you start? Um, I found it useful to start with w what was on the left end of that graph uh, about uh, uh, accessibility and immersion. At the very left end of that is Google Cardboard. And so Google Cardboard was out even two years ago. Um, and it, it, you may not be aware that you could go and make something immersive today with what's already in your pocket. Uh, we've, we found it to be quite useful to just take out, take out everyone's phones, Android or iOS, and open up the Google Street View app and with that, uh, you may have been using it to look at other people's streets, but actually you can make your own street, uh, street views with it. Open it up, click on the camera icon, and, and take 46 pictures in a systematic way and end up with a photosphere in about two minutes. Um, there's a knack to it, but uh, I was able to teach my students to do very, a very good job with that uh, fairly quickly. Uh, and so, so very quickly you can have, you can create yourself or have your students create it. Uh, and, and that, I think, is a great way to teach something else. I'm teaching about VR, but if I were teaching history or culture or geology, uh, I would take my students out into the field and capture these things in a, in a, a way that uh, gets the details and can later be used to immerse people in it. Last year, my class went to Chicano Park here in San Diego, which started out as a protest, people in the neighborhood wanting their own park, and turned into, you know, it's now a it's on the uh, the Re Register of Historic Sites. Um, it's murals on the bottom of the uh, Interstate uh, 5 going through their neighborhood. And it's a beautiful thing, and it doesn't really get captured very well by still, still uh, flat photos. We, we took 50 photospheres of that area, and now uh, we, can, we can put together a tour that makes it much more like actually being there. And in the process, learning both about VR and learning about that little bit of uh, local history. Very cool. Thank you, Bernie. So, Sim, you run a neuroscience lab, so you, you know a thing or two about the brain and how it works. Um, in your opinion, uh, what disciplines are best suited for use of immersive technologies? So, uh, keyword, my opinion, is <laughs> bias. No, but uh, if you're talking about immersion, every uh, field can use immersion. And I'm glad Vinay uh, brought it up multiple times, and I've been harping on this for uh, at least the past four years that I've been here, right, we are only limited by our imagination. So go, go crazy with it. And uh, what you dream or believe, you can actually make it happen. And so now I'll uh, zone into VR and AR and mixed realities. Uh, if something is visual, and I keep seeing that skeleton on the corner of my eye over there, uh, medicine, physiology, uh, it's very easy to implement. So at the moment, we have the tools and the content to uh, use in STEM fields, uh, in music and arts, something that is, any field that is visual to you, that is going to appeal to your visual senses, can be used uh, in virtual 
immersive uh, learning environments right now. Uh, but uh, again, it's you are limited by your imagination. I'm limited by my imagination, and uh, I always go back to thinking about the brain and how the brain works. So I teach uh, neuro neuroanatomy with uh, a hologram using a hololens. Uh, I teach cardiac. Uh, and at me using a HoloLens, and uh, day after tomorrow, or sorry, on Tuesday, I'll be talking to uh, my class about uh, COPD with a virtual patient uh, using the holograms we have. So it's our imagination that took us to making those uh, virtual patients happen for our nursing and PT students. So wherever you want to take it, uh, the question is not is it possible, the question is how do I implement it? So. Uh, Again, I'll, I'll go back to the same thing. Uh, you're only limited by your imagination. Excellent. Thank you. So, Peter, you mentioned the importance of curriculum. Could you talk a bit about the curriculum standards and how they relate to immersive technologies? So, there's a, oops, sorry. <laughs> there's a few things that um, we began to struggle with in, in terms of uh, 360 VR and, and AR and AR kit from Apple, for example is that we discovered a number of pieces of content that we were analyzing. Uh, and I'd be interested in what you were saying in your classes, by the way, in critiquing. Um, that number one, whoever put the content together in these particular examples that we have back home, um, didn't do much planning. They kind of stuck a camera out there and turned on you know, the record button and uh, said, yay. And so you got whole bunches of murals. Um, and so we, we said that really can't um, excite people beyond um, their first roller coaster ride mm. using cardboard or something else. So one of the things in terms of curriculum that we've, did, we've uh, discovered is that writing is very, very important. Scripting your material, your content becomes important. It's great to do a live demonstration, but in many cases our students are going to be looking and using this material on their own in their flat in their dorm room uh, and not just in the classroom. So we need to be prepared to have it fully explained. The next one is, again, when I talked about journalistic ethics, it takes a 360 camera, takes photographs behind you. And if you're a journalist, for example, any of the professions, but a journalist in the field, usually you're shooting linear right in front of you you might have a 40 to 50 degree field that you're able to photograph. But if you're photographing, you're doing a story in a particular um, topic and you've got a 360 camera uh, and or VR set up, what happens if there's a, bar, uh, a, a car burglary behind you that you don't know about, that your executive producer discovers after you've Wi-Fi'd it back to the newsroom? And so one of the things we're trying to work with students is think about who is being photographed, think about the story, and is it doing harm or not? And I, again, I don't mean to sound like a wet blanket with all the enthusiasm up here um, and lots of imagination, but it is important that we look at kind of the other side and how this new technology is really changing the rules, mm. I think, in a lot of ways. Very interesting. Um, so Linnea, um, I'd like to ask you about how we could use immersive technology um, as a platform for research, and per particularly for graduate students and sharing their work. Sure. Well, I came to San Diego State wanting to do um, digital work. Um, I wanted to kind of shatter the pat paradigm when it comes to writing um, linear thesis. Um, so I came to the history department wanting to do something radically different. And um, so my support started in the classroom, and that's where I see it initially starting in the classroom. My professors didn't know what I wanted to do, didn't know what I was talking about, but they said, we'll support you, we'll, we'll do what we can. Um, so as a graduate student, you're engaged with your research, you're learning methodologies, but part of that is also an important component is sharing with your professors, with your mentors, and with your cohort. Um, so having available technologies, um, whether to bring in, like in a case of our VR backpack that we can bring all over campus, or having certain rooms outfitted with the appropriate screens and connections or iPads is a way, even during your research, is testing the technology. Like, is this going to be a platform that people are responsive to? Does this work with my content? How is it fitting in with my discipline? So I believe it starts there. Um, it also uh, needs to be honed in with the support from your professors. Now, whether or not they're you know, versed in virtual reality or augmented reality or working with MR, 
um, just having them uh, support you and then being able to direct you to those who can help you, like a perfect place is ITS. Um, graduate students need the resources um, to have tools um, and skills to work in these technologies. And oftentimes they're not gonna find that, especially in the humanities, they're not gonna find that from their departments or people there. So that's needing to be structured um, in a separate space. Um, along with that is the idea that you can collaborate with others in different disciplines. Um, you can collaborate with a computer programmer. You can uh, collaborate with visual media mm -hmm. arts. And part of that is shifting the paradigm with um, the idea of interdisciplinary work that can count as a thesis, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, support from a graduate division that just doesn't want to see, you know, 12 point font and one inch margins. <laughs> uh, we don't have margins with VR, right? Totally. Um, you know, but uh, still adhere to disciplinary standards, mm -hmm. right? When it comes to citations and research and peer review and all of that, that can still happen. Uh, but creating the space in the classroom with ITS support and then eventually you know, curation so your thesis and dissertation can be housed and viewed and interacted with. Very cool. As a current graduate student, you're talking my language. Yeah. I, can, I can attest to that. Um, so Jennifer, you run eCampus at your university. So how can VR be used uh, to incorporate immersive technology in online education? Right, so with online education, and I think it's for immersive learning. Um, you know, with online students, sometimes they can feel a little bit disconnected. Um, some of the activities, say it's a discussion board post, that's just, you know, you post when you can and you're not truly connecting with your peers. So these immersive experiences can allow you to have that interpersonal skill building, um, creative thinking, um, and you can work together, leadership skills. And so some of those other skills that you want students to learn that are also kind of part of your curriculum, that the immersive environment can allow students to have. So I think that's where we can see the online environment with students kind of transitioning that way. Um, we can also think about how we interrelate that with other technologies we already have. So if we're using regular web conferencing, how can also this relate with that? And I, I foresee those all merging together at some point. Absolutely. And we actually have WorldViz showcasing Visible. So if you guys haven't gotten a chance to check that out, check it out in a couple hours when we do the vendor demos. Very cool way of doing kind of virtual video conferencing with VR. Very cool. Um, so Mihaela, um, how can we address the concerns of accessibility uh, with immersive technology? Well, thank you for that question. Um, I would like to relate my comments to the keynote we just um, listened to where we heard um, immersive technologies described as empathy machines, mm -hmm. right? So that reminded me of a very interesting example at Sundance in the last year. There was a documentary done in VR with interesting 360 video and 3D animation and interaction with audience. And the documentary was called um, Notes into Blindness. And the primary material for the documentary were the audio tapes of a writer and theologian by the name of John Hall, who found himself going blind. Mm -hmm. So he recorded for three years his experience of losing sight. And this VR project was trying to get audiences to experience the world from his perspective. So at the beginning, you saw the world as it was, and then you lost sight, right? And then it became a world of sound. So I found that very interesting because on the one hand, yes, it can be described as an empathy machine because you are trying to experience the world as John Hall experienced it. But on the other hand, there is a deeper irony here because if you don't have sight to start with, then you can't experience what it means to lose it, right? So what are you going to do then? And the producers of the documentary provided several solutions. For example, they provided an audio enhanced soundtrack. They provided even a new soundtrack that described everything as action rather than describing what's happening. So it, you know, it gave a different experience. It also provided captioning. But that whole example you know, made me think how, how much trouble they went to in order to make sure that a technology described as an empathy machine is actually inclusive of everybody who deserves, who is deserving of empathy, right? So I think that these technologies present both opportunities and challenges for accessibility. Um, in terms of opportunities, um, 
I, you know, uh, it's enough to think of the sensory enhancements that these technologies could provide. Mm -hmm. So they could provide assistance and people who, for example, um, do not have the whole range of motions can experience what it means to, to move in a digital environment. But I think that the challenges are equally serious and I would say that the challenges come at us from at least three different directions. So the first direction is the challenge of producing content that's inclusive because truth be told, VR content is mostly visual and it relies very much on visual cues. Mm -hmm. So thinking of different cues, for example, haptic cues to, uh, to address uh, the needs of people who don't see would be a very interesting, um, a very interesting challenge here. The second set of challenges um, have to do with the hardware itself. From the very simple thing that in order to experience full immersion, you need those headgears that are tethered to a computer. So there is a wire there. And um, that wire could present a lot of hazard, especially if you are in a wheelchair, right? So how do we make headsets that don't have wires and what kind of infrastructure do we need in order to have those kind of data exchanges by Wi-Fi, like San Diego has you know, great infrastructure and San Bernardino is copying San Diego and is going to have a great infrastructure too, just to put a plug in, plug in for my university there. Awesome. <laughs> and so that's the second set of challenges. And then there is the challenge of having standardized content, right? So, and standards for accessibility, so VR, doesn't work with JAWS. VR you know, doesn't have standardized metadata, right? So there are all of these challenges that have to be solved. Um, Web3D, for example, is, uh, is thinking about these issues. That's a non-profit organization. It's coming up with a set of standards. But I think that the, the greatest opportunity here is the kind of conversation that universities can have with the vendors and with these non-profits to create policies that are truly inclusive of every learner. Absolutely, very interesting and uh, important questions. So Barry, you are one of the founders of the Aztec Game Lab. And uh, thus far, a lot of the conversation has been about experiencing these technologies, but you guys are actually creating content for these technologies. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, so recently we, uh, I founded this um, student organization at San Diego State. So like I said earlier, we saw this huge uh, community of game developers, but they didn't really have any place to talk about games or to start making games. Um, so we uh, launched Aztec Game Lab. We hold workshops, uh, and we're just trying to get the community up to speed um, on the game engine. Right now we're teaching Unity. Um, and so immersive technology is excellent. It's great for, for education, but it's kind of meaningless unless you have software that caters to exactly what you're trying to uh, teach. Um, so so um, we are bringing the community up to speed with the uh, Unity game engine. And uh, like I said earlier, by fall or spring, um, we might be able to feed back uh, into uh, education here by uh, partnering with uh, professors and seeing exactly what they need uh, and having some, some of these uh, very talented developers, uh, first of all, giving them a place to experiment with the technology and make these new applications, but at the same time uh, giving professors uh, exactly the applications they need to teach effectively with immersive technology. Cool. And Vinay mentioned the hackathon or the, or the jam, and you actually have one tomorrow? Yes, right? yeah, we have a jam. Uh, we've got a jam this weekend. Um, cool. Not using immersive technology, but uh, just because we're still having the community learn the tools. but. Um, as, as we progress and as people's <coughs> skills kind of uh, develop, it would be excellent to, to start doing some of those experiments with virtual reality in the club. Very cool. So I think a question a lot of our colleagues in the room have is, um, I'm already sold on immersive technology, but uh, where do I get started? Like, how do I begin implementing? So I know we've kind of already touched on that, but I'd like to hear from each of the panelists on your just kind of uh, quick advice for how to get started, maybe how you got started. So starting with Linnea. Um, well, I think a quick way to um, get into this, um, I mentioned earlier one of my mentors who has no idea about this, but she's fascinated, um, is partnering. Mm -hmm. So SDSU is big about partnering um, across disciplines, the Arts Alive um, initiative and, and something like that. 
Um, being open to partnering with another instructor from either your department or a different department um, is a great way to get in. Very cool. Yeah, so I would, um, I approached this um, similarly, uh, but I added on the actual finding some money and buying some hardware. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I see lots of smiles out there and um, uh, Several of us, I think, if um, we won the, the $10,000 award for innovation, and so I, I've used some of that money to buy um, $100 and $150 3D cam I mean, uh, 360 cameras. Mm -hmm. um, so that by itself, since the School of Journalism already has uh, what we call sticks, uh, tripods, um, and audio, we've got the, the wireless mics and so forth, we were able to kind of kludge together uh, our own um, um, setup uh, fairly inexpensively. Uh, and then we added in uh, the idea of um, working with in industry partners. Mm -hmm. And so we've got an industry partner, VIAR 360, mm -hmm. uh, which is joining us. And, and the last part is, I think, key for all of our disciplines here. Um, we actually have also partnered with the Radio Television Digital uh, News Association in Washington, D.C. And they're going to be the distributor of all of our work um, to journalistic organizations. So we're trying to take what we are doing in the classroom, in the school and in the university, and then taking it out to our industry partners and so forth um, in that modality. And, and that good money begets, we hope, more good money. So <clears throat> this is a field that is changing like week by week. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's about immersion. And I think the only way after today to uh, continue to get started is to immerse yourself in it. Uh, I, I make a point of subscribing. You know, anytime a new tool emerges, I sign up for it and, and play with it for a while, and that's kind of exhausting. Uh, but <laughs> also looking at uh, Reddit, subreddits uh, that have to do with this field. And also, you know, even you can, you can uh, co-opt your leisure time, your leisure reading to be nudged in this direction. There's a mm -hmm. book called Ready Player One uh, that is, that is a required reading in my VR class, and it's soon to be a major motion picture. Uh, but it's all about a future world dy dystopia in which everyone is living in a, a, a virtual, and, you know, and think of Facebook only on steroids. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, you know, so reading things like this, following the news, playing with the tools is something that is, if you're really going to get involved in this at all, it's really something that you have to set aside some time for and it's, it's kind of fun. So the VR world and the content that exists spans from zero dollars to how much money do you have? Yeah. <laughs> right? And so as a scientist, I asked this question and uh, thinking about this as we are progressing down the stage, uh, the first question I usually ask in my science is, what am I trying to do? Mm -hmm. So if you ask yourself that same question, I'm sold on this, I do want to use this, but what am I trying to achieve out of it? For everything that you want to achieve, there is some price point, free or not free which is available out there, and then what used to be sacrilege in education back in the day uh, is now the first go-to, go Google it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look it up, somebody somewhere has had that problem. Somebody somewhere has given a solution for that. Uh, and there are endless free resources before you go and start making them on your own that you can uh, have access to. So uh, I would say ask yourself what do I want to achieve out of this first, and then progress from there. So I would say if you're not already familiar with your um, academic technology group, or in our case, eCampus, on your own campus, uh, get familiar with them. Because mm -hmm. um, they oftentimes have instructional designers that are interested in the area as well, and they've been doing that research um, and keeping up to date on those things. And they're ready and willing to want to work with you um, and be partners with you, which is what was mentioned earlier. So. Um, and also all this here today, this is an opportunity for us to interact with each other and learn about what's going on on other campuses, and then we can try to build upon what each other's doing as well. So I don't teach using immersive technology, obviously, but uh, I can kind of speak to the, um, uh, the fact that you need, um, or being able to ex access software. Mm -hmm. um, you have talented students. Uh, you have talented students who are practically natives to these game engines and software. Mm -hmm. I've been using Unity for almost as long as I can remember since middle school. 
they know the technology uh, and they can definitely help you um, create software. Um, so look to your students. Believe it or not, they might know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, all, all I can do at this point is summarize. <laughs> what has been said. Please, yes. So, well, so the first thing: understand the medium of ordinances, right? Because mm. um, lots of things can be done. I mean, there is a. Everybody wants to jump in on this bandwagon, mm. but it's very important to understand what is it that the medium provides that no other medium can provide. Mm -hmm. So, understand that first, and then there are two school of thoughts here. One is, you know, just get a lot of technology and throw it at the students and see what emerges. And another one is find some good, good projects and start working on them. And I think that both school of thoughts are valuable. If you do uh, try to find a meaningful project, and I would, I mean, this is the, the route that we took um, to think about all the pedagogical implications of the project, what the medium brings to it and so on then indeed collaborations are crucial. Collaborations with the IT department, collaborations with other departments, collaboration with the students, who are the ones that indeed understand the medium the most. And last but not least, uh, think about sustainability. I think that a lot of VR projects die because nobody has thought through what it would need, what it would take to actually have these projects continue. So one is, you know, support staff, dedicated support staff, but also, if you want to do it with the students that try to build it into, into the curriculum and see how you can build, again, what, like we are doing, how you can design courses that can, that can address particular aspects of the project. Awesome. Thank you for that summary. And I think Peter wanted to weigh in. Too. I just want to invite everybody here that's from the other 22 campuses. If you want to join with San Jose State, we'd love to do some cross pollinization at that point. We've been talking about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about collaborating in, in our campus, but um, there's some really beautiful projects that probably just take a couple of extra people from outside. Um, that um, can add a lot of uh, value, I think. And so I'm willing to partner with anybody, so. Awesome, <laughs> thank you both. Um, so the next question I'd like to open to anyone who wants to answer in the group. Um, so what can we do as students and, and educators to mitigate the potentially isolating experience of being in VR <laughs> when everyone else is in the room with you? So um, what kind of software, hardware, or other techniques could we use for that? <laughs> I, there has to be a time, I, I discovered as soon as I gave everybody, I gave three students because I had three sets, goggles, the other 15 students are kind of hanging out, mm. and I didn't give them a time limit. So, no, literally, I didn't, give, and so, you know, we had people that, of the three, two of them wanted to stay on like for 15 and 20 minutes, mm -hmm. and everybody else just twiddling their thumbs. So I think just from a classroom management point of view, we need to, we need to make sure that you, we're sharing all of this stuff. Um, because none of us are going to have full classrooms of all these lovely pieces of equipment for a while. Absolutely, I agree. And actually, I don't know if anyone's tried Facebook Spaces yet, but one of the, the best things that they implemented is a virtual watch, so you can see what time it is. Because I often, I have no idea if I spent five minutes, 20 minutes, 45 minutes. So aside from an egg timer, which we also have at ITS, um, the, the virtual watch is pretty cool. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Yeah. Please. Well, so one technological solution is to, to have it so that others who aren't strapped into these things is able to see what the other person is, is watching. And uh, unless you do something beyond that, it seems to me that's like watching somebody else watch porn. It's, it's, <laughs> a, it's there's been. nothing for you to do. It could be exciting for you though. Uh, <laughs> so Students I, I think it's really, it's, it's an instructional design problem in that uh, instead of just depending on the wow, and sharing the wow that one person is having, it, it's really the next step after that. It's, it's what do you do next? It is what, what do you, now that we see the Grand Canyon in lurid detail, what are we there for? What do we have to do? And, and de devising tasks that can be distributed among a number of people gives everybody something to do. While one person is deeply experiencing it, the others can be directing them to look in a particular way or picking up something. Uh, that, I think, is a way to scale it up so that more people can, can share the experience. Excellent. Please. Yeah, uh, uh, exactly that. I was about to uh, add that there's this idea in uh, game development, uh, and a lot of uh, recent games have been experimenting with it, uh, this idea of asymmetric gameplay, 
Um, and this is something that we could probably look at with uh, immersive teaching as well. Um, so the idea is that one person uh, has a different function than the others. So you could have one student immersed in the uh, more high-end technology and you could have a networked experience with the lower end technology that's kind of more accessible. So you could have a group of students on the cardboard viewing um, or in the same space as the student who's actually manipulating the world uh, with the higher end device. But that's, that, again, that's a software problem. I don't know if anything like that exists yet. Very cool. So I have a follow-up question. How can immersive technologies be used to increase collaboration and also active learning? Throwing it to me. <laughs> okay. You got the mic, though. I got the mic. Um, so how can this be an like a initiative into collaboration? I think using different mediums and technologies anyway is the invitation to this collaborative ideas, like things that USC has been doing for a long time with the Labyrinth Project, with the production of Pry in 2014. You know, um, again, like bringing folks with different technological abilities from different disciplines and creating something together because it will take more than one person, let's say, to create a dissertation or thesis that would be in AR or VR, we're going to need, you know, three or four voices and backgrounds to do that. Mm. Um, so just the idea of even creating that um, platform and that new exploration is the invitation. Very cool. So Bernie, we've been testing out different types of collaborative software um, Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, way too late into like 8, 9 o'clock, just a couple days we finished with another one. Do you want to mention anything about that as far as collaboration? Well. This is one of those things where I think it's good that we're, we're getting our feet on the ground, or feet wet, or whatever the term is, uh, <laughs> sampling these things. But the technology is not quite there yet for large numbers of people. We don't teach normally classes with three or four students at once. We, we've got a room full of people to deal with. And uh, technology is not there yet for that many people to be really engaged simultaneously. So you either make it a, a, a serial engagement where people can then come and go and then somehow you pull it all together at the end. But I, I really think that is the missing thing, right? Right now, uh, getting into these worlds, uh, you know, let's face it, as soon as you put that thing on your face, you look like a dork. And so you, <laughs> in some ways you don't want to be seen by anybody else while this is going on. But, but it, it's a very lonely experience. Once you are into the virtual world, you're, you're divorced from the people you know, physically around you. So I, I, I think the, the breakthrough yet to come on a scalable way, w which will come sooner or later, is when we can all see each other in a different space and interact in that world rather than, any, you know, any, any, any world. Yeah, so let me, let me um, just throw a little anecdote. Um, I'm one of the National Emmy Award um, judges for um, alternative uh, shows. And so this year and last year were the very first two years that the Emmy competition um, has uh, entertained um, VR and 360 uh, pieces. Um, so even the, uh, the old traditional um, industry is now coming around. But what's interesting was is that the New York Times um, piece that I saw on their symphony, um, and I observed, um, had I looked at the credits specifically, and they had something in the neighborhood of 40 people. Um, that were working on that one story on the symphony. Um, now I say that because um, they can throw a lot of money at these things and experiment at much higher levels possibly than a lot of us here. But um, taking it back to my university, one of my colleagues has already talked to me about doing a homeless uh, story around San Jose. Well, um, I started thinking about that. My students by themselves couldn't do all of that work. And so we need to really begin to reach out to the, the social, um, uh, the sociology department. We need to look at the math department. Interestingly enough, I'm very interested in analytics. And we, we probably should all be talking about measurement mm -hmm. um, and kind of ROI, um, at least in the academic sense. And so I've actually got two computer science and one math one mathematician that are going to be working on this project to simply look at heat maps and um, this idea of analytics on where eyeballs are looking at the particular shot. And so these really begin to shape the story. My students couldn't do it. My, the team that I have couldn't do it by themselves. Technologically, they could. Mm -hmm. 
but it'd probably be C minus, mm -hmm. D plus, right? And I want it much better than that. Well, um, many years ago, uh, sociologists wrote a book called Bonnie Cologne, in which the, this fear of isolation was, uh, you know, uh, highlighted. And there it was the fear of isolation that was induced by mass technology such as the television, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at the history of the mass, mass communication and of media technologies, they have always introduced this fear of isolation. There were always discourses of, oh my goodness, now people are not going to hang up with each other. Mm -hmm. And the same, the same kind of fears accompany the emergence of social media, mm -hmm. right? So I would say that isolation, really we need to think broadly about what it means to be isolated. And while it's true that VR and other immersive technologies are not a social medium yet. Mm -hmm. If you look at what's happening in Second Life, I would say that those experiences are far from isolating. Mm. In fact, a lot of research done on communities with disabilities highlighted how important that space, that virtual space, was for bringing people together who otherwise would never have been able mm -hmm. to travel. Right? So I would, I would shine a beacon of hope here <laughs> about the medium. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's important to contextualize it and look back at history. Uh, speaking of Reddit, Bernie, I, I saw something on Reddit recently with uh, a bunch of people standing around reading their newspapers and, and saying, well, you, play, you blame millennials for not talking to each other at the bus stop, but they did the same thing with newspapers. So did it's, you want to say something? I was just going to say, here's, here's the latest, you know, isolationist <laughs> um, piece of technology. I mean, you, you can't, you've, you've got to look around just at our campus, San Jose State. Students run into me all the time. Sorry. Students run <laughs> going, excuse me. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. FaceTime now. <laughs> yeah, FaceTime, yeah. whatever. So, you know, this is, we should learn from, from our smartphone experiences and take that into the VR experiences, I think. And really quickly, it's worth noting that there's, it's not like there's no effort um, in trying to fix this isolation problem. There's actually a pretty popular application called Rec Room, uh, and it's a, it is a video game. Uh, it's not a, um, you know, an education uh, software, but uh, it, it proves that, uh, like, I've seen videos of people playing this game in a completely empty room, uh, but they're having as much fun as if, as if they're with, like, a huge crowd. Um, so maybe we should look to these applications and see if we can uh, leverage that networked uh, experience. Excellent. Thank you all. So um, an important question that's come up a couple times is what can campuses do to design spaces to facilitate learning with immersive technologies? So we've taken a stab at it here, but it really is just a layer of technology on top of an existing learning research studio. So we don't yet have the answer to that, but I'm curious um, any of your perspectives on that. So I set up a VR lab uh, four years ago went through iterations of uh, different versions of VR and AR and M MR that we have right now. And you can never keep up with it. Mm. So uh, I think we started at a good scale over here at San Diego State ITS where we asked the question, what is the least that I need uh, to provide for almost everybody <coughs> on campus? Mm -hmm. right? And we started with a set of tools that, are, uh, that can be used for Bernie's class. You've got 360 cameras. Uh, you've got uh, different types of 360 cameras. You've got mm -hmm. 360 cameras that can stream. You've got 360 cameras that would go and take a 4K video for you. Uh, then you've got the Google Cardboard if you wanted to uh, use that content. You don't necessarily need the Google Cardboard. You can go to YouTube and uh, watch the same video at, uh, in YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there is the higher level stuff where you have your Oculus uh, Rifts and your uh, HTC Vives that are being used by the astronomy department. So it depends on... Uh, your need, so I guess the, just the way we started is the way uh, anybody else should start from. It was the listening campaign or the listening tool that you invited people who were interested, who were already using it, uh, and then got feedback before jumping into it. Excellent. Please. I would say for creating a space, um, well, we don't have a lot of space on our campus, so um, we're searching for a space, but what, it, what the, Peter and I have talked about is really leveraging the different equipment that we might have in pockets across campus. So we might not all have, you know, 10 to bring to a class, but all of us together might have that many. Mm -hmm. So 
figuring out a way to be organized with the equipment that the campus has and be able to monitor it and check it out and provide that so that everybody has an opportunity. Um, and then there's just, the, it's be better for the students because then they'll have more opportunities to use it as well. So for everyone, um, whoever wants to weigh in, do, do students see value in learning through immersive technology? Yes. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> I'll say yes. Um, when I started working with VR in my humanities classes last year, um, before we had the room, before we had 1120, before we had um, access to the HoloLens, um, I had them uh, immerse themselves for several class sessions and then do vlog reflections mm -hmm. on that experience. Um, and those interviews or those reflections were very important at the time and that made it imperative that that was going to continue in a more formalized way for this semester and next spring and so on um, with my classes. But also in talking to the students a year out after encountering VR and working with it. Um, many have told me that from many different disciplines, one from computer science is um, just coming to mind, Aubrey, um, how that experience um, gave him a different perspective in not only his core classes for his major, but also in design and some other things. Like, so it was, it was inspiring, it was technologically relevant to what he had been studying, um, and also socially rebel, mm -hmm. relevant. Um, so that's the feedback that I've been getting and still collecting from students. And I believe that was one of your students who said, we show up early and stay late. Oh class. yeah, that's David. Yeah, yep. on yeah. the video. Yeah, yep. and he had encountered VR before the class. Uh, he's an early adopter, mm -hmm. and um, they do. Yeah, they stay really late. Like, guys, I gotta go. Me you too. <laughs> right. <laughs> when I'm helping. Yeah, good problems. So um, here's something that I ran into when I first kind of began to introduce this. Students kind of looked at me, going, mm, "Cool," and just had a blank look. They didn't really know what it was. Mm. So one of the first things that I did was I said, okay, everybody here needs to go on, because most of my students have an iPhone, um, Google Play, but uh, the, the App Store, and I said, I need you to go download these three free VR apps. Mm -hmm. And as they did, and I said, I'm gonna give you two points each. <laughs> you prove it to me, I can give you two points. Okay, <laughs> they get motivated by that, mm -hmm. right? And so they came back and almost universally, they're going, this is cool. When did this come about? Uh -huh. Now, I tried to connect that with a lot of them had said, yeah, I guess that I've done this before. And I said, what did you do? And inevitably they say roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> and is this gonna be another roller coaster though? <laughs> I'm going, no. And so that, become, that became the dialogue right in the beginning is to get them to recognize there's a lot of stuff out there. A lot of it's free, um, to your point. Uh, that they don't know that they don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and that became just real important for me to get across. Now, I do have some of those students that are going, no, go home. <laughs> I have to go home too. <laughs> Please. Please. Um, and so that's, but there is the flip side of this. There are students and there are citizens who don't want to have anything to do with this. Mm. And so I've had a few students um, in a non-VR class when I introduced it, they're kind of going, this it doesn't do anything for me. Mm -hmm. And I try to get them involved, and they do an assignment and so forth, but they're just not interested. And I think that we would be doing a disservice mm -hmm. if we forced it mm -hmm. on folks, uh, because I see peer-to-peer -peer enthusiasm much more um, appropriate than, than, than Professor Young um, um, pressure going, I want you to do this. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Uh, I say yes, but, <laughs> for whatever the original question was, uh, are, are, do students find this engaging and compelling? Yes, but uh, will they still, two years from now, mm. when this is a, a commodity, when they've seen this more than one time, uh, I think we're, we, we will be uh, at risk of uh, becoming complacent and saying, yeah, this is so cool, the, the kids are gonna love it. They're not gonna love it forever, uh, unless the experiences we design are really soundly designed, that there is a reason to be there and that you're really taking advantage of it. Uh, it it's, it's gonna be very easy for us to be seduced into just, just the wow part and not taking care of the next part. 
Excellent. So I think we could talk about any of these one topics for probably an hour in, in each one of themselves, but I'd like to open it up to the audience. We have about seven minutes left, so maybe two to three questions, uh, maybe more if we have time. We have the mic catch box in the back, so if you raise your hand, Antonio will try to hit you with it. <laughs> right over here. Nice catch. Oh, it's pretty <laughs> So um, I'm quite old enough to remember the time before cell phones. In fact, I can actually remember the time before PCs because I've been in the computer industry that long. And um, what I see now, right at this very minute, I can see this really cool technology, just like cell phones, just like PCs before them. Mm -hmm. And people are going, yeah, is it going to work? What's it going to be like? I can even remember PCs before there was Windows. Mm. That's how far I go back. And we're right on the cusp of the curve, mm. and it's going to go up really quick. And what will drive it is the people in this room. As you adapt the experience for the people, so they start seeing the value, um, because it teaches them something, because they get something out of it. Nobody, and not many people, I occasionally meet people who don't have cell phones anymore. Anybody here think they couldn't function without a cell phone? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. VR is going to go the same way. But what will make it that, that is that it becomes ubiquitous. So it's one of those chicken egg situations. Mm -hmm. We're already, we're actually well behind the curve, is my guess at this point based on what I've seen. Um, the curve is pulling away from us faster and faster and faster. So I, I think we're barking up the right tree. I would encourage people to try and incorporate and get into teaching. And the vendors around us um, step up and provide something we can use to teach with, is what I would say. And it's, I mean, the, I would curious to know what people think about that. And I see people, other silverbacks on the, on the stage there as well, so. Any thoughts on that panel? Question up here from James. <laughs> nice catch. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question for the panelists is uh, regarding, and this gets to the funding issue and the measurement issue, I think that if there were research studies that were being done to demonstrate the impact on student success, maybe less students are having to repeat a challenging course, for instance, that funding would be put within reach. I'm hoping maybe you might be able to talk about uh, research possibilities, any research that you're doing right now, and one kind of cautionary tale from San Diego State, do not provide the product specification sheets to the IRB folks when you're talking about this research. Um, that's probably a side story that we could tell you later um, because there's some fine print, uh, for instance, with the whole lens that says, you know, you could die using this thing. You know, if you were to walk off the side of the cliff, don't let the IRB people see that. Um, but seriously, um, in our learning research studios, we're, we have a, a blanket IRB exemption to try and make it easier for faculty to do this kind of work. But I think that's really important. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, I'll, I'll answer that. So it's not just you can die by using HoloLens. You can also lose all your data, your, all your sensory data, by using this because it's not particularly secure, right? So there, there are also privacy concerns there. So what we are doing at Cal State San Bernardino, as I mentioned, we are uh, building an educational game. The game is... Um, uh, commissioned by the Department of Anthropology. It's an archaeological game that teaches students how to recognize artifacts in the field and how to infer what was happening on, in the field based on those artifacts, mm -hmm. right? And we want to organize an experiment that would actually compare how students who are playing this game, um, how do they do on a test when they are exposed to a traditional method of teaching about field work and we are actually immersed in this game. That said, I would also acknowledge the fact that there is preci precious few you know, um, peer-reviewed articles that are talking about the effect of VR content on learning. And I would certainly, and even you know, on empathy, mm -hmm. come to think of it, that topic is quite controversial and there are lots of uh, pros and cons and data sub in support and data contradicting that statement. So I would certainly like to see a lot more research done on, on the impact of VR. Excellent. We're in the middle of Silicon Valley, um, Jennifer and myself. And one of the ROIs that I always look at for students over the last few years 
is do they do they get a job <laughs> in in these fields or related fields? Mm -hmm. And I see smiles out there, but that is at least a good indicator <laughs> of what industry is looking to us to feed, mm -hmm. because there's not enough content. There's not enough content developers. To my colleague down here, there's just not. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of really wonderful hardware. But until we can get students kind of trained mm -hmm. in some of the creation techniques, et cetera, um, I think we're going to be lagging behind, mm -hmm. kind of to your issue earlier. Yeah. So I look at uh, jobs. Mm -hmm. And I've got a lot of students that come back and go, yes, I just got a job for, with uh, electronic arts. Nice. You know? So that's, it's not only re I mean, reassuring to me, but it's <laughs> affirmation that what we're teaching is getting them in the workforce. Excellent. I think we have time for one other question from the audience. It's like, uh, so have, does this work? So have any of you uh, actually integrated your experiences with an LMS using like experiential API or SCORM or something else? Because that's one of the things that I'm a developer and I'm having huge issue with the bureaucracy of trying to integrate it into the LMS. <laughs> And there is not really a lot of documentation out there on the correct coding mm. to integrate it. And I was just wondering if anybody had any experience mm. with that. No, I haven't. And it's because it's unavailable. Mm. And uh, what is available is uh, we ca I don't teach my class on Facebook. If I upload things on Facebook, you can 3D it uh, to some extent. But the other way is to uh, create a common or uh, give a Creative Commons license to your own work and put it up on YouTube so that people can watch it from there. And that's one way of uh, going about it. But right now, I don't uh, have an answer to your LMS integration mm. for this content. We, we have Canvas, and I go ahead and put up just the, the working files, mm. um, the 360 files um, that the students then can download and look through their cardboard and do the analysis and reaction. But in terms of actually using Canvas as a platform, and so far, no. Excellent. Well, we are unfortunately out of time, but I want to thank our panelists for their uh, willingness and, and enthusiasm. <laughs>